Hey there, it's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Ion College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching live on YouTube, please smash the like button like you're Brandon Davies. You have consent, and while you're smashing, let me remind you uh, what we've got going on for the next 10 weeks. It's called the Summer Shoot Around, and it's a series during which we're going to focus on 20 notable teams over a span of 10 weeks, two per week, 20 teams in 10 weeks, and we're going to do the schools in alphabetical order. We did Alabama earlier in the week. Today, the focus is Arizona. The Wildcats went 33-4 and four last season, won the Pac-12 regular season title, Pac-12 tournament, just a really terrific year. Got a one seed in the NCAA tournament, lost to Houston in the Sweet 16, but still finished fifth at Ken Palm. From that team, uh, the Wildcats lost Benedict Matherin, Justin Kyer, Christian Coloco, Daylon Terry. That's four of the top seven scores. But they're bringing back Azulis Tabellis, Kirkisa, Pella Larson, Umar Balo. That's four of the top eight scores. They're adding a top 30 recruiting class highlighted by four-star point guard Kylan Boswell, as well as uh, international prospect. Henry Vassar, plus Texas transfer Courtney Ramey. Campbell transfer Cedric Henderson Jr. It's a fighting camel. I've got Arizona ranked 15th in the top 25 and one. How much does dead leg like or not like the team Tommy Lloyd's going to have next season? I'm going to ask him next. But first, word from our sponsors. This summer, Paramount Plus presents the great reality escape. Let's do it. With new series. It's time to celebrate! If you get thrown in, you got to win and new seasons to escape to. You just became my target. I have never seen such savages. <laughs> With attitudes. Give me a damn pizza. Competitions. Survivor's ready. And guilty pleasures you don't have to feel guilty about. <laughs> Escape your everyday reality with our reality every day. This is big. Paramount Plus. Stream now. All right, dead leg. I mentioned I've got Arizona 15th in the top 25 and one moved them up a little bit after Boswell reclassified um, and established himself as a class of 22 prospect uh, who is going to play for the Wildcats next season. Uh, what do you make of, of the team Tommy Lloyd's going to have? Obviously going to look different, but still looks talented. Yeah, uh, certainly it will be different. Uh, I mean, you lose three, you know, three picks, uh, Benedict Mather and Dalen Terry being, you know, high level picks that you're expecting them to have long lasting careers. I actually am a huge Christian Coloco fan. Um, and I think that he will, he will thrive at the next level as well. And then Justin Kiergan as well. Um, you know, this is, we talked about Alabama on the previous episode that that class was ranked third, that incoming freshman class for this season, Arizona, somewhat surprisingly, the class is ranked 40th. In the two four seven composite, only one top one hundred player, Kylan Boswell, uh, top, you know four star, you know thirtieth overall guy. Um, it, it's going to be interesting. Uh, this team will not be as good. I how about this? I went back and I did look because I was curious on this. So Arizona was a surprise one seed last season. Tommy Lloyd had truly on the short list, like among the three or four best debut seasons as a head coach in men's college basketball history, statistically. Uh, only a, a few guys, three guys ever had been uh, the coach of a one seed in their first season as a head coach. Tommy Lloyd is on that list. Um, maybe they, maybe this team winds up getting beyond the Sweet 16 in 2023, which they didn't do last season. Of course, they got knocked out by uh, a game Houston squad. But getting a one seed again is a tall task, uh, particularly after losing three, you know, first round level NBA picks. Here are the teams that have done it in the past 20 to 25 years. All right, just to give you an idea. Uh, not that there's even an expectation of Arizona to be a one seed, but GP's got them top 15 level overall. Certainly, if you're an Arizona fan, you can have some optimism. Maybe you can catch lightning in a bottle again. But to be honest, it's going to be really hard to do. The programs that have done this for the most part, past 20 years, 25 years, Michigan State, 99 to 01, did it three years in a row. How about are you ready for this one, Parrish? Kentucky did it in 03 and under 04 under Tubby. Otherwise, the last time was 96, 97. Kentucky has never gone back to back years with a one seed under Cal. Now, again, it's not easy to do this. Getting one seeds in consecutive seasons. It's easy for Mark Few. Well, I, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Duke did it 98 to 02, five years in a row. Hello. Uh, oh, and this is, I'm not going back the entire, I'm just, you know, back to basically turn of the century stuff. Uh, 04, 05, 06, Duke did it three years in a row, and they also did it 2010, 2011. UNC. Three years in a row, 07, 08, 09. They did it again in 16 and 17 under Roy. Kansas has done this in three di different instances under self, 07, 08, 10 and 11. 
16, 17, 18. Nova did it in back to back years, 17, 18. Virginia did it back to back years, 18, 19. Baylor has done it the past two tournaments. It really would be three in a row. They would have been a one seed in 2020. Gonzaga Don't has done it in three consecutive tournaments. It would have been four with a tournament in 20. They went 19, 21, 22, and they would have had 20. So it's happened. But what's the common denominator with all those programs? Yes, like Arizona, they are blue blood level, right? Look at those. Let me read those again. If not blue blood, certainly uh, modern elite. Michigan State, Kentucky, Duke, Carolina, Kansas, Nova, Virginia, Baylor, as we know it now, think about this 10 years ago, it's unthinkable, but Baylor's done it in Zaga. But look at the coaches there. Few who had Lloyd for two decades, yes. Scott Drew, veteran coach going to the Hall of Fame, we believe. Virginia, Tony Bennett, considered on the short list among the five best in the game. Nova, Jay Wright, Hall of Famer. Self speaks for itself. Roy speaks for itself. Kay speaks for itself. Even Tubby Smith was a veteran coach with a national championship when he did this. Tom Izzo speaks for himself. You either have Hall of Famers, likely Hall of Famers, and Tubby Smith won a title and has done something no one else has. He's taken more teams to the tournament programs than any other coach in men's D1 history there. Maybe Tommy Lloyd gets there. Maybe through some you know, residue of being at Gonzaga for two decades, he does it. But it's going to be a very, very tall ass to get Arizona, not just back, I think, GP into the one seed conversation, but maybe the two or the three seed. Is this going to have to be a situation where Kirk Creasa can be not just the best player on the team, but can he make, let me ask you, Parrish, like, do you think that he can make the jump to bona fide, productive college star in the running top three candidate for Pac-12 player of the year. Because if Arizona is going to be a top 15 team, I almost wonder, is that going to be what has to happen? Or will he defer to Courtney Ramey, transfer from Texas, and would that make Arizona better? What are your thoughts? I, I don't know that Creesa has to be a Pac-12 player of the year candidate for Arizona to be a top 15 team. Because uh, they've got a lot of interesting parts. Like Ramey comes from Texas, you know, averaging, you know, he, he started a bunch of games there. Average 9.4 points per game last season. Wasn't great, if we're being honest. Um, assist numbers, I believe, went down in his first year under Chris Beard. But that's still in a, you know, a high-level Big 12 player. Um, I, I think he'll be better at Arizona this season than he was at Texas last season. Um, Pella Larson's a reigning uh, Pac-12 sixth man of the year. Um, I, I'm assuming he is a starter. Um, on this team and so that'll be an expanded role for him but he shot above 36 percent from three uh tabellus is uh, a guy who's posted you know pretty good uh numbers at the high major level i think he can take a jump and then ba balo as well like th this is one of those deals where um I, I don't know that any of these guys have to be benedict matherin for arizona to be a legitimate top 15 team they just all have to improve at a natural level and you're going to look up and i think be watching a team that's competing with ucla and probably oregon uh with the possibility of winning back-to-back -back pac 12 titles very much on the table yeah without a doubt it, it's, it's certainly on the table there um I, and lloyd it was i mean it was a flawless transition the, the Arizona was one of the more entertaining teams to watch, played a lot of just really watchable, very fun games. I, I like the style Lloyd actually, I think is coaching a style that will, I, I think have Arizona set up for years to come to be able to be recruiting classes that I, like, if you told me that Arizona, if you told me Arizona is going to be an NCAA tournament team, every single season that Tommy Lloyd's there, which is no guarantee. But if you tell me that's the case, and I'm going to tell you this is probably going to be his lowest ranked class because of the way uh, that he, uh, we know him as a person, how he operates this program seems to really be consistent with how he was as Fuse chief assistant at Gonzaga there. Um, but Matherin was, I mean, Matherin was such a dynamo GP. Coloco was, in my opinion, a top five defender in the sport last season. Tubelis is back and he's a good play. He's just, he's, he will be very good. Like he will be a very, very good college player yet again this season. I fully expect that Larson will be solid. Bala, we've been kind of waiting on. He he has been considered something of a raw talent for a long time. He transferred. He went with, I mean, he hopped in the van, so to speak, with Lloyd, left Gonzaga to get some time at Arizona. Maybe he winds up being like a true breakout player this season. I don't know. Ramey, 
Ramey has a lot of uh, tantalizing talent. You said you have this team 15. I promise I won't make this a, a running conceit on these summer uh, episodes here. I, I would probably go a little lower. And now I'm saying this having not, uh, you know, sorted out the echelons yet, GP. It, it, I would I would definitely have this group ranked, you know, by ranked in, you know, in, in my own top 25 or so. But... I'm looking at who they bring back, who they bring in, and I and I think the Pac-12 will be competitive there. Um, one more side note on on the schedule: uh, in, in, uh, Indiana is going to be playing Arizona and Vegas. They get Tennessee at home, and then Arizona plays in the Maui bracket. But that those matchups haven't been determined yet. Here's who's in Maui: Arkansas, obviously potential Final Four team. Cincinnati, maybe a sneaky tournament team in year two under West Miller. Creighton, projected to be the best team in the Big East. Louisville, we'll see what they are uh, in, in year one there under Kenny Payne. Ohio State, normally pretty good. Would expect it again. San Diego State should be pretty good again. Texas Tech should be pretty good again. That's actually that's a winnable bracket for Arizona, but a lot of quality teams in there. So the non-conference will be challenging. Uh, this might be a team that we... See, take a few lumps in the non-con GP for, before it finds its real its real gate, if you will, in late January into February. Just to clarify for some folks who are listening closely, I mentioned that the recruiting class was ranked 30th. You mentioned it's 40th. I, I'm composite. Am I yeah, yeah. No, I, I just want to make sure people know we don't have the numbers mixed up. 24-7 Sports has it at 30. The composite rankings have it at 40. So we were just referencing different numbers there. Um, you know, it's not... A, 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 an elite level recruiting class, but you know, th they, they did add a couple of transfers in Ramey and Henderson jr. Ramey looks like a projected starter. You never know what Cedric Henderson jr. What a player uh, moving from that level to this level, whether they're going to be able to replicate their production. Honestly, often they don't replicate the production, but can he be a meaningful depth piece for Arizona. Maybe he's a six, six guard. He averaged 14 points, 5.6 rebounds per game uh, for Campbell this past season, shot 38% from three. He's averaged at least 12.4. He's an older guy, did a year of junior college and then played three years at Campbell. And so now he's a super senior um, with a year of eligibility at Arizona, averaged 12.4 points in all three seasons at Campbell shot 36 0.7% from three in that span shot 45.2% from three as a freshman 38% as a junior so a guard with size who is a proven shooter at the collegiate level and uh, I love him because he's my little homie from Memphis and he's also a fighting camel he's a fighting camel from Memphis nice. I mean what what how did this not lead the show how did we not just start with that his father a great Memphis player, Cedric Henderson, played in the NBA, played on those uh, great uh, early ninety, mid nineties Larry Finch teams. I don't know if you remember him, I but he was. Not. I was actually just I was, if you're watching on YouTube, I was trying to seek in my mind, but I have no memory of of his father playing. I, I think his dad was a McDonald's All American in high school, and then played at Memphis for Larry, and was a high level player, played in the NBA, and so here's the latest, not latest in a long line of um, professional athletes' children who have become you know, relevant, you know, uh, athletes in, in whatever sport. It's a big thing in basketball, football, and baseball. And Cedric Henderson Jr. is uh, another example of that. I, I don't I don't think he's going to compete for Pac-12, uh, you know, honors. But mm -hmm. can he can he be a can he be a impactful piece off the bench for an Arizona team trying to win back to back Pac-12 titles? Maybe. I hope so. I, certainly possible. I would keep the out. You mentioned Larson. I think I think you like him. I like him a lot too. He had a broken foot at the start of last season, and if you were watching Arizona play into the tournament, Pac-12 tournament, I'm in my, in my opinion, it was it was Matherin, Coloco, and then Larson was right there with Terry, as far as I'm concerned, in terms of being the most important players on this roster. I would anticipate he is going to be the guy. That will take the biggest jump. I think the staff is probably expecting him to make the biggest jump overall. 7.2 points last season there. How he blends with Ramey. I, in, in some ways, I almost, you know, I, I come back to, to Creesa, Ramey, how, how they play off each other. It's going to be, it's going to be a different, it's going to be a different looking kind of team. Ramey's definitely the best. 
Uh, you have to evaluate Ramey as the best newcomer, right? And by newcomer, that could be a freshman coming in or a transfer there just because of his college experience. And I think that they're expecting him to be um, a kind of player who can be better than he was at Texas. If he is, then yeah, you're going to be in the right vicinity GP on where Arizona should be slotted overall. To me, feels more heading into the season. 21 to 25 ish as opposed to top 20, but that's just my quick scan of, of everything they have there. And that is, it's not as much about the guys they have coming back as it is. This was a one seed and losing Ter- Terry, Matherin, Coloco, even Justin Keir, who was a good producer, uh, how they adjust to that, I think will be interesting. And then just year two, again, you know, Lloyd had it really good. In year one, can you sustain that for a second season? I think it will be a challenge. They're certainly up for it. And again, Arizona has, there's been something about this program in general, GP, be it the stuff that was off the floor under Sean Miller. They've been an interesting program with the exception of when they went on self-imposed postseason ban and then they they became irrelevant. Only that pocket. Otherwise, for the past five, six years, there's always been something with Arizona. They'll probably have that again this season. And Creesa, oh, but I have to mention this. Creesa, there's an opening here. He could become the most loved and hated player in the sport. I mean, he is a willing and wanting and eager trash talker. It is part of his game. It, it may even improve his game. He's outspoken. I love, I love it. Uh, we need more of these kind of players and characters in the sport. Uh, another year, you know, a veteran player. Uh, I certainly hope that's the case there because uh, it gives Arizona a little more swag and, and any, anything in college hoops to bring those kind of guys who are outspoken, I think is good for the sport. I look forward to the, uh, the trash talking and the, the villainy from uh from Carissa that probably awaits this upcoming season he only shot 33.6 percent from three last season which was down from his freshman season so I'd like that if he's going to be the primary ball handler I'd like that number to come up a little bit I'm sure Tommy Lloyd would as well um if he can be a more consistent perimeter shooter uh then this is a guy who's gonna I would assume you know push to average you know 13 14 15 points uh per game and um, just one last thing before we get out of here. Um, you mentioned you think Courtney Ramey's the the best trans, best newcomer. I think that's obviously true, at least on paper. But um, the two freshmen that are interesting, we've mentioned them both, but just to expand a little bit, uh, Boswell, I believe, was a five-star guy in 2023 before he reclassified to 2022. Now, according to 24-7 Sports, he's a four-star guy, like top 30. Um, but, like, man, if you've got somebody that talented coming off your bench – uh, that's a great depth piece. Uh, you, you know, uh, the the history of reclassified freshmen is is um, a little all over the place. But if he can play to his talent um, as a reclassified freshman, then again, that's a great piece to have theoretically coming off uh, off your bench. And then Henry Vasser, I'm not going to pretend like I've watched him a million times. He's a six ten center from Estonia. Um, but I've watched the YouTube stuff and he seems to have NBA potential. Like he's a, uh, a, a modern center in the sense that he can rim protect, but also step away from the basket and, and make perimeter jumpers. So, um, you know, I, I've seen him described in some places as the best international prospect who will be a freshman in college this upcoming season. So, you know, keep an eye on those two freshmen. Uh, they're not going to come in, uh, super duper heralded like you know some of the other freshmen in the country but uh, I, I think both of them can probably be you know meaningful impactful pieces for an Arizona team that uh, can win a, another Pac-12 title even if I've got them slotted second in the Pac-12 if you're interested in the top 25 and one right now I've got UCLA at 10 so that's first place in the Pac-12 followed by Arizona at 15 second place in the Pac-12 Oregon at 20 third place in the Pac-12. And if I were to try to slot a fourth, probably USC, Andy Enfield's Trojans. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Huck Larnell. Thank you guys once again for listening to the uh, Ion College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe. Anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, Apple, Spotify. Leave a nice review. There's more of us than there are of them. And we will we'll talk to you again real soon. Till then. Take care.